Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webcast of tonight. Uh, we've had a bit of uh, misfortune due to sickness, which uh, caused us to postpone it from the Monday we were supposed to be live. Um, and tonight, my voice isn't the best, so I'm hoping it works throughout the entire webcast. <clears throat> so excuse me in advance if I do a little bit of sniffing and throat sounds. Today we have prepared a tools and gadgets special. So I have a number of things I want to show you, uh, both physical things and softwares. So gadgets are the physical things and tools are the softwares. So without further ado, let's get to it and take a look at the first gadget of tonight. And that is this little thing here. This is the uh, 3D Connection Space Mouse Compact. Or actually, it's, it's not the most recent version of the product. This is a, uh, I think it's three or four years old actually. But it's virtually identical to the one they, they sell today. Um, it's called Space Mouse because it's, in a sense, it's a mouse that allows you to navigate in space. And what they mean by that is that you can move in more than two dimensions. So rather than just doing sideways and depthways, this little handle here is manipulatable. So you can actually push and pull it away from you, towards you, to the left, to the right, up and down. And on top of that, you can also tilt it in six directions. So you can tilt away, tilt towards left, right, and well, I would call it rotate. So you can, you can rotate it left and right as well. So this gives you movement in six dimensions. And it means that you can, you can use it to, to move objects in 3D. And the most typical application is to move the camera in a 3D design software. So let's plug it in and uh, see what we can do in capture with it. So here I have the alpha view in custom mode and when the mouse is plugged in you see there is a, a blue LED nice little highlight <clears throat> around the base of the mouse. Now I'm a right hand person so I'm going to rotate it a little bit here. So in capture the space mouse navigates the camera of the view and in capture, we have the orbit and focus concept, which means that as we rotate or orbit the camera, we are rotating around the focus point in our 3D environment. So if I grab the, the handle of the mouse and twist it to the right or the left, you see the camera rotating around the focus point, which is about center stage. Now, if I tilt the mouse away or towards me, I'm rotating along another axis around the focus point. We have, however, locked it so you can't do the roll rotation because it is, quite frankly, very difficult to navigate with that. You very quickly get out of the um, non-tilted plane. And finally, you can push and pull it towards and away from you, to the left and to the right, and you can pull it up and down. So in effect, you can do, the better you get, it takes, it takes a little bit of practice, let's be honest here. Um, you can do very nice camera movements with a bit of practice. Uh, you may want to uh, uh, fine tune the sensitivity to suit your, um, your fingers, I suppose. Um, so it's a very useful tool for doing presentations. So when you are showing a design to, to somebody and you want to move around, <clears throat> of course you can 
you can jump between camera positions, but if you see the transition between the positions, you get a better context, a better feeling for, for what is going on. And of course, just when designing, when you, when you, you might have your right hand on the mouse, you can have your left hand on the, on the 3D mouse or vice versa. <clears throat> uh, it creates a very efficient setup, um, especially if you need to look at things from, from different positions. So the Space Mouse Compact is around 200 euros. Um, it's available from a company called 3D Connection. Hopefully we're getting some links pasted uh, along with the video feed here as I go. Now, it may be difficult to see, but there are actually uh, two buttons here as well, one on either side of the base here. Um, unfortunately, these don't do anything in Capture. This is something we are improving in Capture 2019 where one of the buttons is typically the fit button, which means that the camera will focus to the selected object or the entire design if no object is currently selected. So that's a very nice device. However, 3D Connection have a series of products and they have one which is a little bit bigger than this. So let's unplug this and switch to the next device which is the Space Mouse Enterprise um, for larger enterprises, I suppose. Again, plugs into the USB. <clears throat> they have a wireless version of the smaller product as well. Now this one has a backlit color display which needs more power, so I imagine that's why they don't have a wireless version <clears throat> of this device. Now in the center here is the same sort of joystick thing, the, the core of the product as the uh, Space Mouse Compact has, and this works exactly the same way as the Compact. Um, but of course, in addition to this, uh, we have a range of additional buttons around here. Now even though many of them don't actually function in Capture 2018, um, on the left hand section here we also have shift, control, alt and escape and enter and these basically mimic a standard keyboard so these do function with Capture 2018 and if you hang around for an uncertain amount of time but not too distant in the future then Capture 2019 will also let you use the buttons on the right hand side here which has uh, three programmable camera locations, uh, the standard top left front view, a lock button that basically disables rotation of the camera, and also an ISO button which jumps to, to any custom view, and again the fit button which we had in the compact version as well. Uh, and then of course the icing on the cake are the programmable buttons at the top here. Um, a little bit difficult to get through the camera here. Um, but you can program them with standard Windows functions and possibly in Capture 2019 these will have other capture functions too, but that has actually not been decided yet as we are waiting for some feedback from 3D Connection as to whether it will function on the Mac as well. So this device is a little bit bigger and a little bit more expensive. This one is around 500 euros. Um, but of course adds more functionality. Uh, the programmable buttons have uh, come with functions in other applications than Capture as well, of course. So even in your web browser, they do things like jump back and forth and open the history or whatever you would like them to do basically. So let's move on to the third product from 3D Connection, which is a regular mouse. So this is the CAD mouse. It is by all means a regular mouse, with the notable exception that it's got one, two, three mouse buttons. 
That means we have a <coughs> excuse me, dedicated button in the middle. And if we can have the 3D view from capture added to the video again, as you may know, the, the middle mouse button on the mouse is a shortcut for the navigation. So rather than having to move the mouse to the navigation buttons, you can always use the middle mouse button to navigate in capture. Now on many mice, you can also press down the scroll view button, but as I've been informed quite recently, uh, that may actually have a different function by default in Windows 10 recently. I'm looking at my camera helper here who pointed this out to me. So this is the CAD mouse. It's around 100 euros. It's a relatively large mouse. So if you're among those people who like to rest your entire hand on the mouse, it's perfect. Now I prefer to rest my hand on the table and just move my fingers, but it works pretty well for that too. But most of all, it's, it's got a nice weight to it. It's not, it's not too light and flimsy, and it's also not so heavy that you feel like you have to put an effort into moving it. So it's a really nice and balanced mouse, and the, the quality is really nice. Now I, I feel like a 3D connection salesperson here, but it is a genuinely nice mouse. I've bought way too many mice. Um, more than I would like to admit, and this is a really good one. Um, and that's basically the entire 3D connection portfolio. There is uh, one 3D mouse between the compact and the enterprise, and they also have mouse mats, but I think that's about it uh, of what they offer. Uh, and hopefully you have the links right below the video by now as well. So, let's move on. Um, I'm gonna have a quick sip of water here because my throat is drying out a little bit. If you have questions, make sure to post them as we go. Right. So let's see what we have below the table here. <clears throat> the next thing I want to show you is tiny. It's the color pin. This is a product. This is how, this is how tiny it is. It uh, reminds you of the old negative photo plastic tubes that we used to have in Sweden anyway, and I'm sure in other countries too. This is a product made by NCS. NCS is the natural color system company, which produces, among other things, these color charts that I'm sure you have seen. And the color pin is a color scanner. What that means is you can point it at something and get information about the color of the object. So I have a set of colored sheets here. And I'm going to show you how to scan at least a couple of them and apply them to a material in Capture. Um, the color pin is made of metal and it connects by Bluetooth to your cell phone. Please don't call me at the moment. Um, it's got twist caps on both sides of the color pin. The top side is also where there is a micro USB connector, I think it's called, for charging, because it connects by Bluetooth to the cell phone. So you run the color pin application in your phone, iOS or Android, doesn't matter. It connects automatically by Bluetooth. And the first thing you need to do is to calibrate the device, which there is a button for uh, down here in the middle. It tells you that you need to have the calibration cap on as you do that. And then you press calibrate and it's done. Now, if you wonder, the calibration cap is actually coated with a white 6,500 Kelvin plastic, I suppose. So it's like a reset for the color scanner. So keep that clean and don't lose it. What happens next is you hold the color pin 
onto a surface and you press the scan button in the application. And what happens is you get details about the color you've scanned. You get RGB as well as LAB color values. And it also tells you the matching NCS color or RAL color as well. Um, well, or the ones that are closest to the color you've picked anyway. I've tried it in the NCS charts and it, it picks the right NCS color every time. So as far as accuracy goes, it's accurate enough from what I can see. Now what happens in here is because we get the color in RGB as well, if we add the capture screen to the video here, I've prepared a project file here with four <coughs> color screens. And I've prepared materials for the four color screens as well. So I can take the RGB value. Um, and my Windows is in Swedish, but I'm sure you understand what I'm doing. So we've got a red of 242, a green of 232, and a blue of 1. Three. So that is the first uh, screen that I have here. Now, of course, the lighting conditions are a little bit different, um, which becomes apparent as you move around the view uh, in capture as well. So let's stick to this view. I'll scan at least one more color. Um, I realize uh, it's mostly interesting to watch that first or second color. So we have the second screen here as well, which it tells me has a value of 2037380. So there is your red as well. So apart from <laughs> replicating colors. So if you're redecorating your house and you have something you want to match a color with, you can, you can grab your color pin, scan in, in the kitchen or the living room or what, wherever you are redecorating. And then you can go to the paint shop and say, I need this one here. Um, and this is likely the type of the device they would use in the paint shop if you bring the object with the color that you want them to give you the paint for, so paint is the correct word, yes. Now in capture, um, <clears throat> it is valuable in two ways, I would say. One way is getting the right hue into your design. And especially if you have walls painted in, in the same colors, or if you have large surfaces that are single color, and then taking the time to scan the correct color and getting that into capture actually does a lot for the visualization. Even if it's just those seemingly gray walls that might turn out to have a little bit of blue or a little bit of red in them and also getting the um, reflect, not reflectivity, the intensity right of the color is important because I mean, gray is essentially anything between white and black and getting the shade right is, is important. Uh, when we did the, uh, um, the competition in Germany recently with SGM, uh, I went down there and I scanned the colors in the demo room and I can tell you that it makes a big difference to have the right colors. So this is the NCS color pin. Uh, it costs around 100 euros. It's available well, from companies that would typically deal with paint or even artistic material uh, and possibly some print shops. So <clears throat> I'm going to need a sip of water again. And then we move on to the next little thing. And the next little thing looks like this. Ah, uh, okay. So, 
This is the DataPath Vision LC HD2. It's a <clears throat> dual channel HDMI capture card with a PCI interface. So it sits in your PC, and I'm afraid it does have to be a PC and not a Mac. And it allows you to capture two HDMI streams into the computer. And DataPath supports uh, the Windows Media Foundation, which is the Windows way of communicating with devices like this. And that means it works really well in capture. So this is maybe one of the best working video capture cards with capture. Um, again, from DataPath in the UK. This card is around 500 euros, give and take. And there are a few different varieties. Uh, there are those with SD as well, of course. Um, I think possibly a, a single channel SD or HDMI and a four channel SD, I think. Um, it's not very big, but it does the job flawlessly, so what more can you ask? Um, there's not much more to, to add about this, so take a look at DataPass products. Um, this is a part of a new range of capture card products they launched about two years ago uh, with a price tag that is maybe more appealing to uh, uh, to those of us who wouldn't use this on a daily basis, let's say. So, let's move on to software. However, I'm being informed, so if we switch to the computer screen only, that there might be questions. So question number one, is it possible to program a camera path um, with DMX question mark? So if you want to program a camera path and render a movie, let's say, then you need to use the DMX patched cameras. And you can patch a camera uh, from the views tab in capture. Um, there is a patch line down here where you can patch the cameras to DMX. Um, if you use the 3D mouse, then you can't actually save the movement. So you, you can't save the movement and render a movie of it. It's just something while you're doing it. Um, another question was whether that works in wireframe and plot views as well, and yes. The 3D mouse works in all the types of views. Um, so it works in the view that is activated. So I can use it in all three of the views. And it doesn't matter whether it's wireframe, live, or plot mode. It works the same way in, in all of the modes. If you have the enterprise one, <clears throat> which has the little lock button, if you remember, then you can lock it so that it's not rotating, and then effectively you have a pan and zoom version, in a sense, as you're working, which is quite nice. And finally, uh, do we have a list of hardware for capture, um, I'm not sure whether you mean video capture hardware or all hardware. I don't think we have a complete list, but as for the video capture cards, then anyone who has a Windows Media Foundation driver will work with capture. Unfortunately, this does not include Blackmagic's products because they only support the old um, media infrastructure from before Windows Vista. Uh, so they haven't bothered uh, to support the new stuff since uh, 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, they basically rely on everyone using their own stuff directly. 
Um, all right, let's skip ahead. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I want to show you is SketchUp. So I feel my voice is sort of slipping a little bit, so I'm going to... Actually, can we, can we get the, the, the hardware camera here again? So I wasn't planning on doing this, but I have to, to show you this one. This is Jello Revoice. Uh, I'm getting funny looks here now. <clears throat> this is an interesting little thing that basically creates a slime in your mouth and is very good for your throat if you have a sore throat. So that's my health advice as well. There you go. Now let's move on to SketchUp. So we've mentioned SketchUp a lot of times and we have tutorials that show you how to import from SketchUp into Capture. Um, but we've never actually shown SketchUp itself or how to create something in SketchUp. Um, SketchUp is a 3D design software that sits somewhere between if you have AutoCAD and Vectorworks on one side and you have 3D Max, Cinema 4D or Maya on the other side, then SketchUp is somewhere in between. And when you start SketchUp, you always get this blank workspace with a person uh, in the center. And there is a story be uh, behind the, <clears throat> the people that you get in your blank project. So if you have some time, you can look that up. Just as in Capture, uh, the middle mouse button is a navigation button. Or if you press the scroll wheel button, this rotates the camera as well. And typically you click on things to, to select them or as right now I clicked on the pen tool to show you how to draw something very basic. So I'm just going to draw something silly to show you roughly what you can do with SketchUp and why it's interesting for you as a Capture user. <clears throat> so using the pen tool, you can very easily draw um, any basic shape that you need. You can see that it snaps to the corners of items you have already drawn. It also snaps to midpoints and it snaps to orthogonal axes. Now, because of this very sketchish, sketchish way of drawing and the fact that it's called SketchUp, it's easy to believe maybe that SketchUp isn't very accurate. But the fact is SketchUp is no less accurate than AutoCAD because you have full precision in what you're drawing. And if you want, <clears throat> you can choose to type as well. So if you want something to be 11.4 meters, you can type that into the text field <laughs> down here in the corner and use it much more in a sense of the AutoCAD way where you might type distances and point in the right direction and, and have the CAD software draw a shape for you. So the, the line tools or the pen tool obviously lets you draw lines. Now one of the tools that has made SketchUp so attractive is the push and pull tool that allows you to grab a surface and basically extrude it. And again it's snapping to other surfaces and levels around you which is really useful. Uh, another nice tool are, is or are the arcs tools. There's a few different ones. Um, but again, it's very easy to, to draw shapes with it. There is also an outline tool. So as you can see, it, it's very easy to create shapes that you wouldn't really create easily in Capture. 
and have it done in no time in SketchUp. SketchUp comes in two different packages. They have one that is called free and that is web-based. It allows you to do, well, the things I've shown you and a lot more, uh, but it's not intended for professional use. So if you are a professional user, you should buy the pro version of SketchUp, which is around 600 euros. Um, that is still significantly less than if you were to purchase AutoCAD or, or Cinema 4D of, or any of those packages. Of course, it's a little bit a different type of philosophy in SketchUp. Um, but we also have the ability to apply materials to surfaces. Uh, there is a decent material library in here. And what's more is there's also a very large 3D object library that is called 3D Warehouse uh, that you can access online and download objects from and directly in the SketchUp file format, which we can import and capture. <clears throat> so let's save this weird stage design we have here uh, onto the desktop. So let's call it stage. So I have the SKP SketchUp file on the desktop. Then we can go into Capture and import that model. Uh, let's have a top view. Switch back to live. And here is the object I just drew in SketchUp. To be honest, I'm a little bit surprised what happened with the materials. Um, they were supposed to come along. Uh, I must have done... Ah, sorry, yeah. <clears throat> it helps if you look at things from the right direction. Ah. Uh, also helps if you have all the objects. So anyway, here are the surfaces with the materials. Now, what happened here was that as you import into Capture, Capture splits any items with different materials into different objects because in Capture you can only apply one material to an object. So because I put different textures on different surfaces here, they came in as separate objects, and then I ruined the selection and confusion ensued. Either way, um, SketchUp Pro is a desktop application in Windows and on Mac. It costs around 600 euros. It's a personal license, good for two computers. Whereas SketchUp Free runs in your web browser, <clears throat> it allows you to do the things I just showed you, but you need to have an internet connection. And if you do things you make a living on, you should be buying the pro version. But I guess they have the pro, uh, sorry, the free version is free also as a demo in a sense, so you can try some things out before you invest in the pro version. So that's SketchUp. Um, now I want to show you quickly another tool, which is called the NDI Scan Converter. Now, this is the most difficult tool to show you because it hardly shows anything when it's running. I have the tool down here on the taskbar. And when it's running, it ends up in the system tray, which is behind me at the moment. Ah, right there. But there is a menu that opens if you click on it. And the idea of the NDI scan converter is to grab a region of your desktop and stream it using NDI on the network. By default, it grabs the entire screen and scre streams it on the network, but you can also configure a region of interest. 
So let's assume I want to stream this design session in SketchUp over the network. Then I can configure this region of the desktop. And in Capture, quite magically, under NDI inputs, I now have this live video stream of a part of my desktop. So if you have a media server, a video player, or even just an image viewer, and you want to get that as live video into Capture, using the NDI scan converter is a very fast way of grabbing the screen and getting it as video on your network. The scan converter is part of the NDI tools, which is a download and installer from Newtek, the company behind NDI. There's a few other tools that come along with it that are interesting too, like the, the NDI test card generator that generates test patterns. Um, but it's free and you can download it from Newtek's website and the link should be right down here along with the video. And finally, let's just check the question status here. I think it's question time, yes. Um, Tim van Bruinsels is asking if we support any 3D screens, um, to which the answer is no. Uh, we used to support the 3D side-by-side -side sy system, I guess you can call it, or standard. Uh, this was popularized with the 3D movies, um, but unfortunately, it, the the markets didn't take to it that well, so they have stopped manufacturing those 3D TVs, uh, which is effectively killing that standard. So the next thing for us is probably going to be VR, um, but that is still a little bit in the future for us. Um, also, it seems that SketchUp might have changed their pricing and it might now be $300 per year. Uh, they must have changed it in the one and a half week between when we should have aired this and today. And finally, there is a question about scale. Uh, when you're importing objects from other design packages, um, the scaling can sometimes come out a little bit weird. So when you import in Capture, in the import window here, in the lower right corner, it says drawing unit. Now in this case, because I'm importing from SketchUp and Capture can reliably determine the scale of SketchUp objects, I can't edit this field. But if I had imported a DWG, which is a file format that does not understand scale, then I could help Capture by entering the correct drawing unit down here. It's also possible to do that afterwards in the properties of objects, you can find the drawing unit property down here. So you can change it post import as well. Uh, Andre also asked if the space mouse works in plot design by which I think he means the plot editor, which quite frankly, I'm not sure. Uh, I could try it right now, but I'll try it and, and post a clarification once we've done the video instead. So uh, the final thing I want to show you is also related to file formats, import and export, and that is the Autodesk DWG TrueView application. So I'm sure you have sometimes received a DWG file that opens weirdly and you are wondering whether Capture is getting it wrong or whether there is something wrong with the DWG file. Now DWG is an acronym for drawing. Acronym, well it stands for drawing and it's Autodesk's own file format for AutoCAD. And Autodesk have made a viewer for DWG files. And because it is their format, you can reliably say that if it looks correct in TrueView, then the file is good. 
If it looks broken in true view, then there is an issue with the file. There are a few other features too that I will get back to in a moment. So let's export the model from Capture to the desktop as a DWG um, theater. Or let's just do that. So now I've exported the design from Capture into a DWG file and I can open it in TrueView. I get a warning that the DWG file was not made with Autodesk. Um, Autodesk are happy to point out that everyone else is basically um, piggybacking on their file format, but it is the most popular, so just acknowledge the fact that it's not an Autodesk file. Now, if you are familiar with Autodesk, you will know that in the top right corner here, or AutoCAD, there is a navigation tool and a small little home icon here <clears throat> that if you press it, the view automatically fits um, what you had. So here, as you can see, the DWG from Capture seems to look good. Uh, so everything is probably fine with the DWG file from Capture. However, one of the main reasons you may want to use this application is actually another, and that is the button up here in the left corner, which is called DWG Convert. TrueView lets you convert DWG files into other versions of DWG files. Um, now, even if we at Capture try to keep Capture up to date with the latest DWG format, in theory, it can be up to a year before we are compatible with the latest version of AutoCAD. So if you were to receive an AutoCAD 2019 file right now, for instance, then you couldn't open it in Capture. But you could use TrueView to convert the DWG file to a 2018 AutoCAD file, and then you could import it in Capture. And likewise, if you have exported a DWG from Capture and you need to send it to someone who can only open an older DWG file, then you can back convert it inside TrueView as well. So it's both a viewing and a conversion tool. Um, and a validation tool to check up on whether DWG files are correct or in any way broken. So that was all I had to show you here. And it seems I have one more question. Can we do a video material on an object to realize a video screen? Yes. So. That is one of the ideas with capturing video in Capture. Boy, have we been confused with that terminology a few times. <clears throat> but I have the video here now from the desktop. And if you remember, I have these four screens in the back here. So I have materials ready-made for them. So if I take the material for the third screen, I can hook it up to the NDI input which is now actually grabbing live video from my desktop. So the NDI scan converter is grabbing the video from the gamma view, feeding it back into capture over the network, and then we're applying it to the surface back here. If I want to simulate an LED screen, then typically, <coughs> excuse me, I also want to give it some luminance. So if we turn the fixtures off, or if we just move the screen. Yeah. So by giving the material a luminance as well, then it will shine by, its, by itself and act more as a video screen. And finally, if you use the LED screen objects from the library, <coughs> sorry, then you also get the pixel pattern effects as you are zooming in and out. 
And now, quite fortunately for my voice, I'm out of questions and I'm out of my voice. So thank you very much for watching and see you soon again in another live webcast. Cheers.